Hi, my name is Ben Atkinson and welcome to the Functional Health Podcast. I interview some of the leading voices in nutrition and lifestyle medicine, and I will share with you their stories, their expertise, and their advice, shedding light on the industry from each of their perspectives to help improve your health from today. This week, I'm delighted to share with you my conversation with Dr. Jenna Machocki. Jenna is an immunologist and specializes in understanding how nutrition and lifestyle interact with the immune system in health and disease. So, without further ado, Jenna, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. It is such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come and speak to me. You're welcome. <laughs> So the main topic I would like to cover with you today is resilience as it pain, pertains to the immune system. I guess not just how we avoid getting sick, but also how we can ensure the body can bounce back from illness, which sounds similar to most people, but they are distinct. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about first was exercise and how this plays into immune health. Now, a lot of people might be thinking, exercise how how is that at all related but actually it plays a huge factor into how our robust our immune system is um wh- how did you because i understand you you are actually a fitness instructor <laughs> what 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 kind of came first you, your interest in uh, exercise <laughs> from the immunity standpoint or or the fitness element that's a good place to start really yeah so um it was actually after I'd given birth to my twins um, that I kind of just had a life crisis, a loss of identity that often happens, I think, when you go through like a big life change like that. And I just really couldn't face going back to work in the sense of how I had been working before. It just felt really overwhelming. But I was doing, I was living in Switzerland at the time, so it was quite different to the UK. There's a lot of postnatal support and Mm -hmm. physio to help women recover from childbirth. And I was doing a lot of um, postnatal fitness and got friendly with the instructors and um, they encouraged me to go and do the training. So I became um, a fitness instructor and then did sort of additional training in pre and postnatal fitness. And then I did that for for um, quite a bit of time after my kids were born. So I was training um, pregnant women and postnatal women. So, you know, it was amazing to see what you could get people to do. I mean, we had people squatting and um, doing all sorts of different types of exercise and, you know, body weight as well as weight training. Um, And it just, it's quite profound. There's quite a lot of research showing how this can support a healthy pregnancy and um, recovery from pregnancy, the other side. So I sort of learned a lot um, and I'd always been into fitness. Like it's something I love. Um, So it kind of just brought those two elements together. Um, But yeah, I think fitness has a profound effect on our well-being. And we kind of know that we should be doing so much exercise per week and there's all the sort of government guidelines and stuff. But it's really not... I don't think it resonates with people enough just how important this is for our our well-being, our longevity, and particularly our, our immune system. I mean, part of the reason I sort of jumped on to social media a few years ago was because I was just bored of the narrative around the immune system being like, you know, vitamin C is important for, you know, <laughs> when you get sick or take zinc supplements. And I just like, there's so much more to it than this. And exercise is one of those pieces in the puzzle. I always think about it as there's things about our immune system that we can control and there's some things that we can't. Mm-hmm. And exercise is one of those levers that we can really pull on. Um, and I, I, I almost like to reframe exercise as movement because yeah. I've spent so long in, in the literature, you know, trying to figure out what, what's the perfect recipe to, to, to exercise for your immune system. And it kind of just always boils down to the same thing is just move more, move more often and move in lots of different ways um so i just think of it as movement it's amazing how much movement you can stack into your day without actually doing any exercise um for me like doing the school run uh tidying up the house after my kids have 
you know, gone a bit crazy, um, you know, doing laundry, carrying my groceries, you know, nipping out on my bike to run some errands. Um, and I do track it on my watch and you get an idea of how much movement you've done in your day and you haven't even been near a gym. Um, and especially after having kids, when I couldn't go to the gym when I wanted to anymore, um, I, I relied on this as a kind of metric of, of moving my body. And it sort of made me realize I didn't need the gym. And I think it, it's an important message because in the last year and a bit, we've had the COVID situation where many gyms were closed mm -hmm. and we saw people struggle a lot with the, you know, trying to take that into their, their homes, myself included, because it's really motivational to be in a gym class, to work with a instructor. But I remember when they shut the gyms and I was like, I've got a few little bits of fitness equipment at home. I need to use it now. <laughs> uh, and I need to, uh, you know, develop a habit that's in my day where I'm going to include uh, a little mini kind of workout every day mm -hmm. or a mobility session or do some resistance work because it's things I enjoy and we don't know when the gyms are going to open. So we need to kind of future proof ourselves with movement by, you know, finding ways to include it in our day that aren't in the gym, don't require expensive classes or equipment um, and I think it's not easy but it's it's a habit that you can develop with a little bit of investment in mental energy. I completely agree with you there and it, luckily it seems like movement comes quite naturally to you when I think other people <laughs> <laughs> other people maybe find it hard to fit it in their day. I know I probably rely quite heavily on the gym um, but you are absolutely right. You can take it upon yourself. And YouTube is a wonderful resource now of just like yeah. classes which you can just draw upon. Or oh, there's tons of apps now, Fit being one of them and numerous others which you can tap into. Even dance classes, which, yeah, you know, exactly. I embarrass embarrassingly tried and uh, I am absolutely <laughs> terrible. So I know it's meant to make you That's better, the... but that just put me off. <laughs> The beauty of doing it at home is that nobody needs to see. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know why I'm telling you now, but there you go. Um, <laughs> but what was um, quite amazing to me was I thought I was doing myself a service by going to the gym and doing these kind of grueling 45 minute to an hour long sessions. But it turns out when it, as it pertains to immune health, you can just go for a walk and it has profound yeah. effects, right? which I think exactly. is really good to know for the general public. Like you don't have to go to the gym or be a gym bunny in order to get these benefits. Yeah. I think um, one of the things that I find quite profound is that um, we have these kind of training zones depending on our heart rate. So um, zone two training, for example, is, you know, a, a walk where you're getting a little bit breathless, but you're not running. So it's, um, it's raising your heart rate. It's getting the, you know, the blood pumping um, and it, it's really benefiting your metabolic health. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of where the magic happens. So, you know, about 30 to 40 minutes of walking at a really brisk pace is actually giving so many of these benefits to our immune system, to um, our metabolic health, um, without having to do something that's really intensive. And I think that that is more accessible to most people, like taking that brisk walk, um, is something that most people can maybe find achievable rather than making it to a class at the end of a long busy day when you, your mental energy might be lower, you might be physically ready to move your body, but the motivation to get there and do that when you've already had that whole day of, of things on top of you, I think is, is lower. But yeah, so fall in love with this zone two training. And then I'd say sprinkle a little bit of zone five training which is when you're going flat out max effort maybe once a week do some sprints that you know to that point where you're like oh my god my legs don't work anymore or jump on a bike and pedal as fast as you can um, or do some hit training but very short and sharp and this has kind of an additional benefit but it's like the cherry on top you just you need that good foundation which we get from just that kind of zone two cardiovascular stuff so getting a little bit breathless a nice cycle or walk um and then you know you take it up as far as you want for your own personal fitness goals mm -hmm. um 
and you know it, it's moving all that lymphatic fluid around the body which is the kind of conduit for your immune cells to move around and part of their job is performing like a surveillance function so they're looking out for untoward things trying to get in your body and you need to move that um fluids around the lymphatics to allow them to do that uh, yeah, the lymphatics cause... don't sorry i was gonna say they don't rely on the heart because it's a separate circulatory system so the blood is moved by your heart but the lymphatics are moved by you moving your muscles that's exactly the point that i was just going to touch upon <laughs> touch upon there <laughs> and when you when you said hit i was just thinking you know putting out laundry doesn't suffice as a as a hit cardio workout you really do have to to push yourself in order to get get those benefits and um, but i think you're absolutely right you can put it in in your day like one thing that i've started doing having read your book and others similar um kind of concept is that he's just fitting it in when you can so if I have a phone call with a friend or even at work I mean I'm sitting down to do this podcast now but when I can I will walk outside I mean I live in the UK so sometimes it's raining and that's not always available unless I want to get really wet but when I can I just all all pace is something that I do as well just in the house and you'd be so surprised within like 15 to 20 minutes how far you can get because in 20 minutes you can cover a mile Oh, and then, really? Yeah. Just round about the kitchen. <laughs> just round about the kitchen, yeah. Well, but, yeah. But um, what I mean is like walking around as a, yeah. so even going to the shops or something like that, I will be yeah. on the phone and then just, that is something that you can do. And I try and like, because not all of us have all the time in the world and we're trying to do multiple things at once, always try and fit in some form of movement within that. I mean, I spoke to Daryl yeah. Edwards and we were just talking about, you know, sitting as the oh. new smoking and the kind of, the, the idea that you have to move your lymphatic system around yeah. and even just how that makes you feel in terms of your alertness yeah. Um, yeah. Is, is profound. I've definitely had yeah. a huge benefit and I think part of that actually is just getting outside in daylight when quite often I'm office-based. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's, I think it's accepting that the way our our world is constructed now, most jobs involve computers, being indoors, um, sedentary work. And so you have to be really proactive to work against that, because it's kind of crept upon us, like our grandparents' generation probably didn't have that challenge, because their jobs involved movement. So now we kind of have to be very proactive to find ways to counteract the sitting because exercise at the end of the day doesn't really counteract all the negative things that sitting for prolonged periods does so it is about breaking up um those uh different uh periods of sitting and i also think a lot about getting older so a lot of like for me, the immune system it, it is more like not protecting us from like, you know, catching a cold next week, but it's about protecting us in the long game. So the chronic diseases that come with aging, that's where we can intervene now with small things that can stave off that. And I think that, um, you know, that's sort of where we should shift our focus to a little bit like that long game and and just moving regularly that's part of the piece in the puzzle to sort of help us prevent this tidal wave of chronic diseases that we're seeing that are happening with aging but earlier and earlier in in the the process yeah I completely agree with you there and when we're talking about immunity and exercise and just to to get some context what are we actually talking about here because i guess the immune system we could be talking about individual cells and how they're regulated Mm -hmm. or like the risk of getting certain conditions related to the immune system and what i'm talking about here or thinking about is also immune conditions so maybe it's good to identify what exactly exercise is doing for our overall immune health yeah exactly there's multiple uh, components to this so we've talked a bit about the lymphatics and um, what exercise is also doing it's it's a sort of temporary stress short-term stress on our body which helps our uh, at cellular level um, upregulate um, sort of things that help mitigate stress so we're kind of making ourselves more res- resilient um, it causes inflammation in the short term and by that process it upregulates our own kind of anti-inflammatory processes so we're kind of causing a little bit of damage to then get this beneficial um, 
uh, activity of, of sort of anti-inflammatory response to quench it, which has numerous benefits because we know having kind of elevated unwanted inflammation is, is feeding into the, the chronic diseases that are growing in prevalence. So it's got this kind of real anti-inflammatory component um, and it's keeping our metabolic health um, in a good condition. So, you know, the mitochondria are these little organelles inside all of our cells that are converting, um, you know, what we're eating and all that energy into something usable. And these are critically important in our immune cells. So we don't often think about the connection between our metabolism and our immune system. But, you know, when your immune system jumps to action to fight off a cold, mm -hmm. you're... Um, mitochondria inside those cells are flick, flicking different metabolic switches to allow your immune cells to change their function to go off and fight a virus or that sort of thing and so we need to have the mitochondria in in a good condition and to do that we need a good level of, of um, fitness uh, and to challenge our mitochondria and by taking on um, you know, fitness and, and improving our fitness we're improving our mitochondria which then filters down to our immune system um, but I think for me, um, one of the most underrated benefits is that we need to keep um, a, a decent amount of lean muscle mass in our bodies. So people are, you know, will think about BMI or body weight or body shape. What I think is most critical is, is what is your body made up of? What is your fat mass compared to your muscle mass? And from our thirties, if we don't use our muscles, they will start to shrink because muscle is quite energetically costly for our body to hang on to. So if we're, um, you know, sitting a lot and only using, you know, a, a tiny amount of our muscles, daily the other ones that we're not using so much will kind of get sacrificed because why is our body going to hold on to that when it takes a lot of energy to keep it and muscle is quite interesting because it's it's full of immune cells um it's helping this sort of anti-inflammatory component of exercise but also it produces particular molecules cytokines that have a really rejuvenating effect on our immune system. So not only does our muscle mass start to decline from our 30s, but this particular immune organ that's in our neck called the thymus gland starts to shrink from our 30s and it's called a thymic involution. And the thymus gland is responsible for producing T cells, which are kind of like the master controllers of the immune system. They come in many different flavors um, and they do a whole host of different jobs, including regulating against things like autoimmune disease. So this thymus gland shrinks as we age, but we can mitigate some of that by keeping our muscle mass, using our muscles, helping them produce these cytokines that are going to rejuvenate the thymus. Um, and so that kind of dictates your immunological age really. And so by exercising, particularly resistance exercise or strength, anything when you put a force against your muscles, so it doesn't have to be lifting weights, it can be lifting shopping bags, lifting your children, doing gardening or, you know, Pilates, even some forms of yoga um, using resistance bands at home that kind of thing you're giving your muscles the signal that they are needed and that your body should hang on to them it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get bigger muscles uh, unless you um, go down the path of trying to uh, to do that which um, requires putting as much force as possible and uh, over time increasing the amount of resistance work you're doing um, but I think that we, we, you know, we might get out for a walk, we might do some cardio, um, particularly I know women in my age group that I speak to quite frequently have come from that mindset of like cardio, cardio, cardio to burn calories. And it's literally about trying to get a specific body shape. So the only exercise they do is cardio to burn off, you know, things that they might have eaten that, um, may lead to them gaining weight, but no, they're not thinking about muscle mass. So uh, I think that's got to be a shift in the narrative that when we start really valuing muscles. And mm. this is so important to immune aging. And we know, you know, most of us will have heard about the COVID situation. Immune aging is one of the key things that can lead you to suffer more severely with this virus and other infectious diseases. Yep. 
I, I definitely would love to dive into the COVID point. I just want to revert back to something that you said before with the with regards to musculature. Um, and it was to do with, because the muscle mass is quite mitochondrial dense, it's also, um, I was speaking to a friend about this and he called it metabolically expensive. So you burn more mm. calories the more muscle that you have. And I'm yeah. also wondering when, going back to the resilience element, whether because those mitochondria are so... Um, prevalent within muscle tissue, is there any evidence to show that those with an increased mus musculature or would have a greater resilience to certain illnesses based on that improvement in mitochondria biogenesis, I guess? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely um, measures of, of strength. Some, some uh, people use grip strength and there's a few other kind of metrics that can determine a person's um, the strength of their muscles so it's obviously not just mass but how functional they are mm -hmm. um, and how that correlates to things like frailty which is also indirectly correlated to you know resistance to infections and ability to heal and recover so I'm not sure that there's a great deal of literature looking directly at the immune system but there's a lot of literature that would kind of infer that that would be the case because of uh, having frailty because of your loss of muscle mass and muscle function and knowing the immunological consequences of that. But I think that's, it's probably um, a, a sort of under-researched area. We know a lot about cardiovascular fitness, but less about strength training on the immune system. There's really not been so much work done um, in that area, but I'm hoping that that's something that grows in the future. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. I mean, I only just thought of that based on what you were just saying there. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's got my mind whirling now. There you go. <laughs> um, um, going back to what you said about COVID, it was incredibly interesting to see that some of the, the greatest risk factors for um, mm -hmm. worse outcomes were to do with obesity, high blood pressure, hypertension, yeah, and also type 2 diabetes, all of which are improved in one some degree or another with exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, you know, we mentioned the metabolic benefits from exercise and obviously things like um, uh, type 2 diabetes and the sort of um, precursors to anything to do with the, the blood vessels and heart disease that they come under that kind of metabolic um, syndrome mm -hmm. uh, bucket. So we do know that exercise is important uh, there. And um, this, you know, is associated with lower, uh, raised levels of this kind of low level inflammation, which is going to put an oxidative stress on the body. So it's going to require more um, antioxidants to really kind of mitigate that. And, you know, you may have issues with blood sugar regulation in the, in the case of pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes. And we know that that's really um, detrimental to the immune response and muscles provide a sink for some of that glucose so there's quite a lot of evidence to show that just going for a short 15 minute walk or standing for a period of time after you've eaten a meal helps your body remove the sugar from your blood based on the meal you've just eaten and put it into your muscles um, and when it hangs around the blood too long that's when it becomes kind of problematic it kind of sticks on your immune cells and on your antibodies and then they can function less well and they're not so able to sort of move around and and attack any germs that might be coming into your body so blood sugar control is kind of a real cornerstone I think of having um uh, a well-functioning and resilient immune system and obviously uh, a lot of the conditions you mentioned like metabolic issues, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, obesity, um, blood sugar control can be an issue in these situations. That That's absolutely fascinating and something that I didn't know because I know you can get measures like uh, HbA1c, glycosylated hemoglobin, but I didn't realize immune cells were affected by high blood glucose. Would that be the same for high insulin as well? So protein, I suppose, and high leucine uh, containing protein could that also give the, the same effect in terms of the insulin response leading to like an effect on immune cells? Yeah, I think definitely insulin um, can have quite a profound effect on the immune cells. The literature I'm more familiar with is, is on um, blood sugar, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, did, I think 
these are all giving signals to what your body is doing and that's it's sort of going to be intermeshed with your immune system so through your metabolism this field of sort of immunometabolism so even things like leptin and ghrelin which are controlling your appetite these are influencing your immune cells because they have receptors for all of these hormones on them so they know like when you're eating what you're eating <laughs> and they're responding to that so, so you need to sort of bring that balance in um to to the food you're eating to the blood sugar control uh and it, it's almost like your immune system is interpreting that and and getting that sense of balance and um, through the actions that you're taking you know what you eat and, and the times that you eat Mm -hmm. no, that, that makes perfect sense um when you were talking about um aging and, and these kinds of conditions because people always talk about the kind of metabolic dysfunction as like a, a disease or conditions of aging so type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. hi hypertension etc but i was reflecting on this recently and thinking is this more of this these kinds of group of symptoms are they more or conditions are they more of a reflection of the body unable to cope with a diet or lifestyle which is not fitted to that individual person? Or is it just because you know, as we age, we become less resilient? Actually, now I think about it, I'm basically saying the same thing. But hopefully you can understand what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. I think, you know, things like... Um type 2 diabetes was originally referred to as adult onset mm -hmm. because type 1 was picked up in in children but i think now we see children with type 2 diabetes and um they're they're less they are diseases that accompany aging but aging doesn't necessarily have to bring these diseases i mean if you look at centenarian populations they are not normally struggling with these uh, conditions and we're seeing a creep towards them happening earlier and earlier and I think it's definitely a reaction um, and our immune system is kind of at the center of that because they all have this unified theme of, of inflammation which is coming from your immune system responding to to changes in our diet and lifestyle that are not um, particularly helpful so um, just things like over consuming calories and not having a calorie appropriate diet you know that is a, a sort of oxidative toll on the body um things that erode our gut health that are going to lead to it becoming a, a sort of um leak of inflammation into the body so just all of these little uh things are building up and we're not putting in the countermeasures enough so all the kind of um fresh fruit and vegetables that contain all these powerful compounds to kind of uh, counterbalance that um, nurturing our gut microbiome so that it can help regulate and train the immune system in the right way um, so it's definitely a reaction to, to the modern world um, and it's not quite clear how we're gonna <laughs> unpick this <laughs> Yeah, no, I completely understand. I, I think that there are, it's multifaceted, isn't it? And I think hyperpalatable foods is definitely up there with one of the reasons oh, definitely. That, that people overeat. Um, and I don't know how we really combat that apart from just like one of the things that I always say to, to um, people and clients when I used to see them was just don't go to the supermarket hungry. <laughs> like it, yeah. it's certainly my downfall. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that's one of the things which I think was such a practical change. And it was just there. Uh, so, yeah, if we go to the supermarket, it's after lunch on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what we mm -hmm. do. And we buy for the week or, you know, we might buy a few things during the week, but we try and do it once a week, a big shop. Um, and even that practical element drastically changed what I bought and my um, kind of what's the word? my kind of want to buy these foods, my desire to buy them in terms of processed foods and things like that. I try and eat whole foods as much as possible. Yes, I'm a human being, so I don't do that all yeah. the time. But, um, you yeah. know, the majority of the time, that's definitely what I stick to. And I think for most people, for the most part, that's what people should consider too. I think that's true. I think it's very easy to make a goal about what you would like to, to change about your diet. You know, it takes a few seconds for me to announce that I'm going to 
eat this and that and it's all going to be so nutritious and, and really nourishing for my immune system but implementing that goal is the, the you know where there's a huge gap that we all fall down and and i think that the goal needs to be tiny and incremental and that means if if you know if you're not getting your five a day then you work slowly up to getting your five a day and just by getting to the end of the week and saying oh i just i had a few more fruits and vegetables across my week it gives you that kind of your brain gets that reward signal that you're encouraged by to then then the next week maybe sprinkle a few more fruits and vegetables throughout your week um and it can be quite hard to do that because of the food environment that you mm -hmm. mentioned but then also social media showing us all these like amazing um edited uh, views of people's lives where it's like wow they're eating what um and, and then you make these big goals that you could just you just feel like a failure and you get in that cycle of, of doom so i think it's really important for people to figure out where they are at right now and realize that the steps to get to where they might want to be it's, it's kind of this long slow plot but it's really worth the investment and there'll be days where you just you know sack it off and get sucked in by whatever you see at the the checkout and um you know eat all the things that you know are probably not going to make you feel good or perform good in your daily tasks but there's a, you know, start again tomorrow and, um, I don't know, change slowly over time. Yeah. Or start again in the next meal. I feel like everyone's start, yeah. starting a diet on a Monday. I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> you know? I know. <laughs> <laughs> why, not, why not tomorrow? What's the, what's the stop? Yeah, I don't know. But maybe that people just need to get there in the right frame of mind. And that's why they're yeah. waiting to a specific day of the week. Um, yeah. which I understand too. So I don't mean to put you off if you are planning to start a diet <laughs> on Monday or start to eat healthily or more healthily. Um, and another thing which I wanted to talk to you about as well, now you've mentioned food, I think I feel we should stay on this topic, is that uh, mm -hmm. you spoke about in the book and actually on another podcast that I was really interested in is the idea that we get this small amount of information when we actually eat food. Um, maybe you could dive into that a little bit more, why that happens and if it actually has a negative effect on our immune health yeah i mean this is something i've been fascinated about for years it was actually one of the reasons i went to switzerland was to work on this topic um and it, it's actually reaching it's becoming more um accepted in the scientific community and more researched um if anyone is familiar with tim specter his um uh predict studies did some work around this that came out in the last 12 months which was amazing and and what you get when you eat any meal um even the most healthy meal you get this real transient um opening up of the gut barrier so it's kind of like uh, we call it postprandial epithelial permeability. So it just means those those little cells that line your gut. It's like a delicate lining, one cell thick, and they have these little junctions between them. They become a bit leaky, and this is helping with the digestive process because obviously it's helping uh, nutrients to go through. Um, and then a lot of the other stuff that might go through includes bits of your microbiome which are essentially microbes, which have on them, on their surface, all the molecular patterns of microbes, which your immune system has basically been tuned to respond to with inflammation. Because if you cut your finger and you get some microbes in there, they have these surface patterns that, that give a red flag to your immune cells and they go, okay, right, let's you know, get rid of this with some inflammation. Obviously this happens in the gut and these bits and bobs are being absorbed through but your liver is sort of dealing with that and you've got lots of immune cells in the gut up to 70 percent and one of the reasons is that they can sort of help counter that and it's very transient and if we're having a good diet um, that, and what i mean by that is one that contains a uh, diversity of plant fibers because these are the things that are going to help seal that barrier back up again um, and you also have a healthy microbiome because the microbes as part of digesting that fiber are producing metabolites um, such as short chain fatty acids and one in particular called butyrate 
it's kind of a byproduct of these microbes eating your food. Butyrate is really important for gut barrier integrity. So it's helping to seal that gut back up after your meal and everything sort of goes back to normal. But for that transient time, you have this kind of switching on of inflammation in the bloodstream. And it's, as I said, very short and insignificant when your body has um, everything that it needs to, to sort of keep that in check. Um, there's certain things that can exacerbate this. So fructose, which is the sugar found mm. in fruit, but only when you have sort of massive amounts of fructose in the absence of fiber. So eating the fruit with all the fiber is actually been found to be beneficial for the gut and this gut barrier. But when, you know, fructose is sometimes added to lots of processed foods, so high fructose corn syrup, for example, or if you're having sugar sweetened beverages, some of these may contain fructose or lots of um, fruit juice um, can exacerbate this um, post eating inflammation. Even things like really high doses of vitamin C, because um, that can open up the gut barrier. So if you're, you know, smashing through lots of supplements, and I've had, I've worked with people who've been do, doing this, and you reach a certain point, you get gut upset from certain doses, high doses of vitamin C, and it's, it's really exacerbating the the sort of leakiness that happens when you when you eat food saturated fats another one so Ooh. that's found in lots of um can i just dive in here before we move on to oh, saturated yeah. fats the when you were talking about like um uh, microbial compounds or these small uh, molecules sure. entering the, yeah. the the gut barrier is is that are you referring to lipopolysaccharide there uh, like lps lps yeah, yeah. endotoxin and, yeah. yes exactly yeah I mean, anything really that's in your digestive tract. So not only the food you're eating, but any, I don't know, bits and bobs that go down, <laughs> go down and you swallow, yeah. um, you know, could potentially get through when the barrier is a bit more permeable. Okay. Okay. That's really, really interesting. You moved on to plant fibers, healing the gut. And th this is, this is really interesting because um, I know there's been a big movement around carnivore. And then people having like, yeah. a, a, have you heard of this movement or? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. I didn't want to dive into it. And then you're like, what? And um, people are just eating meat. So people just eat meat for a certain period of time. And I found this I know. fascinating because even though it's not been out in the mainstream, it's still not very mainstream, but it's not yeah. been out in the ether for very long. And um, But people are talking about it more and more because they're getting a remission of a lot of the gut symptoms that they maybe had, mm -hmm. like IBS and things of that nature. And I'm wondering if yeah. this is more to do with the fact that they had dysbiosis to begin with and we are not feeding these through plant fibers. Yeah. So maybe as a short-term intervention, it could be beneficial. However, I have concerns with long-term use of it yeah. due to just causing oh, more dysbiosis and um, but I would love to get your opinion on I, it. I, I echo what you said I think if you're getting an alleviation of symptoms by removing all plants and only eating meats I don't know if they eat eggs and dairy too but basically mm. uh, whatever the carnivore diet consists of there was definitely something wrong with your microbiome before that and i do get it that you might be getting symptomatic relief because whatever was causing that you're not feeding those bugs anymore because we have good bugs and bad bugs inside our our guts and the the proportions of each can change depending on you know medications you take lifestyle factors dietary factors and if you have more bad bugs and the good bugs are not getting a foothold to do their job then yes they're going to be digesting what what's in that plant fiber but perhaps producing stuff that is less helpful and more irritating to the gut. Um, so when you remove that, you you feel wonderful. Uh, but how long does that continue for? Because I just think there is so much evidence now on the long-term benefits of um, plant fiber in the diet and a diversity of fiber um, for longevity. And I just, uh, yeah, I would be <laughs> interested to see the long-term outcomes. And I think anything like that, even things like FODMAPs, you know, mm -hmm. which are these different plant fibers that can irritate people with a sensitive tummy. And when you remove or reduce the FODMAPs, you get an alleviation of symptoms, but it's only ever supposed to be a short-term 
um, program working with a nutrition professional before you reintroduce and you rebuild that tolerance up to these fibers. So um, I think, I, I mean, I have this conversation with people a lot because they're like, I, I'm intolerant to the, these, you know, 70 different foods. And I'm like, <laughs> if you're intolerant, it means you can build tolerance. It doesn't mean you exclude them forever. But I think that people get scared off because they don't want to have flares of symptoms and that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely right. And, you know, there's certain gut bacteria, which, because a lot of people say they have an aversion or a sensitivity to gluten or dairy. Mm -hmm. And there's actually certain bacteria which seem to help with the digestive process of these foods. Yeah. I mean, you might not be celiac, but people will swear they have an intolerance to gluten. And I dove into the literature, literature somewhat on this. And even though I... I do believe non-celiac gluten sensitivity to be real. Mm -hmm. um, there is a mounting amount of evidence looking at bifidobacteria longum and others um, seeing that they can circumvent a lot of this intolerances that you can get from gluten. And, you know, th this relates to other other intolerances as well, dairy being one of them too. Um, so I found it fascinating that people can think that, you know, my body is just rejecting this. And actually... It might just be that your gut's not robust enough to deal with the food yeah. yet, but it's not to say that'll exactly. that'll never be the case. Yeah, and it, it is about adding in and, and not cutting foods out. I, I think it's detrimental to your mental health as well when you become sort of trapped in a food prison, um, not eating loads of food because of perceived intolerances. And I think in those cases, it really is good to get professional help and sort of work through. Um, you know, restoring some of that gut balance and, and improving tolerance to certain foods. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you there. More with you there. And I realized uh, we dove off on a tangent, which is completely my fault, but you were just about to touch <laughs> upon, you're about to touch upon saturated fat and no doubt I'll have a, oh, another yes. <laughs> interjection before then. But <laughs> Yeah, so saturated fat is a, another one that has been um, shown to really exaggerate this, this leakiness and this post-eating kind of inflammation that happens. And actually, the, the thing that I liked most of all about the studies that came out um, of the PREDICT trials in the last year was that um, they showed that even people who are genetically identical, so identical twins, could have wildly different post-eating blood sugar and post-eating inflammation responses to the same foods. And I do find on social media, you get a lot of like, like don't eat porridge because it will send your blood sugar wild or don't eat this. And it's like, how do you know? Because my microbiome is not your microbiome. <laughs> you know, I, I, porridge I mentioned because I saw that quite a lot. And then I was like, my granddad ate porridge for like 95 years. And I don't think I ever saw him have like a blood sugar yeah. dip. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he was uh, never hangry. He was never like, oh my God, you know, low blood sugar. <laughs> but yeah, I'm speaking just, my it, language. I mean, I, I spoke about them, sorry. I'll let you finish. <laughs> I'm getting too know, excited. <laughs> it really kind of cemented for me that these unique patterns of microbes that we have in our gut are what's going to define what foods that you know we can digest well and absorb the nutrients from. And so one size fits all approach isn't always um, the best uh, case, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I was just going to interject there. I, I know we've completely interrupted you again about saturated fat, oh, but we will worry. get there. Um, <laughs> with regards to carbohydrates, I actually spoke to Dr. Hiel, I'm going to ruin her surname now, Chioff. She's an adjunct pro professor at Rutgers University looking at uh, nutrigenomics, and she's also a dietitian. Mm -hmm. And um, we were talking about this, and it's like microbiome certainly plays a part in terms of carbohydrate mm -hmm. digestion but so does genetics i mean it's probably mm -hmm. one of the strongest predictors of carbohydrate tolerance for some people is the amy1 gene um, and yeah. how, how many copies you have so and i found that absolutely fascinating as well so when you see things yeah. on social media i'm like there's so many factors which I could know. influence <laughs> this <laughs> including like how much exercise you do how sedentary you are basically exactly. and i was like this is you know. what you eat the carbohydrates with um, yes, exactly. And even so. things like meat, you know, there is the studies on um, TMAO, which is something that can happen uh, in the gut when we eat meat, which is not 
helpful for our body, but it depends on what microbes you have present. And it also depends on what you're eating the meat with. So if you're eating it with loads of leafy green vegetables and fresh produce and everything, then it, it's not that meat is necessarily going to be bad for your health. But in some people whose microbiomes might not um, have the right mix of microbes, then um, meat might be not so helpful for you. So uh, we don't have that, the sort of tools to, to measure ourselves at that level yet uh, in the greater population, but hopefully you know, that's where the future is, is going and we can then tailor our diets to our microbes, our genetics, you know, um, all sorts of factors as well as what we enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. That, that needs to play a, play a massive role too. Um, <laughs> With a comment on TMAO, though, because, I mean, I, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts because my mind's not completely made up on this. Um, because looking at populations that eat fish, now fish increases TMAO vastly more than red meat mm. um, to the point where if you put it on a graph, red meat is basically doesn't really show up very much. Um, but populations that eat a lot of fish, they actually have improved health outcomes on basically all metrics yeah. that you can measure. So it doesn't seem to play, even though it looks mechanistically to be the case, it doesn't seem to play out in humans. And there hasn't been a randomized control trial to, to look at this either, but it would be quite difficult yeah. to, to control for. No, I think that that's, you know, I mean, I love the mechanisms and I'm all about, you know, reading and researching, but it, it just often doesn't play out the mm. way we think it will when you go into that kind of, oh, here's an, an outbred human, not a lab rat, and <laughs> going about their daily life and wait a minute, it doesn't quite add up. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, it's, it's just fascinating. I mean, there's always concerns with with meat and I just think we're, we're just constantly learning what a healthy diet is um, and mm -hmm. what it's not, but also what it is and isn't for different populations at different times of their lives. Yes, exactly. It's always changing. And that's something that um, also is an important. I think as we get older, or if you struggle with um, a chronic disease, like an autoimmune disease, I think that your antioxidant capacity is lower and the things causing oxidative stress are higher because things are just like a car wearing out with time. Um, and I think that you maybe don't, maybe you have to be more savvy with your choices of what you're eating if you want to feel good and vital as you get older or, or if you have a chronic condition. And sometimes I think maybe that's just how it is. Maybe that's why kids have an aversion to vegetables <laughs> <laughs> because they don't really uh, need them as much as we do. Because oh, that's they're, a funny way you know, of looking at <laughs> I don't know if that's ever been studied, but that's something <laughs> I has crossed my mind. <laughs> yeah. Is this because you were struggling to feed your own children? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on those days when I'm like picking the broccoli up off the floor after it's been thrown around. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can understand that. I think my mind would go there too. Maybe you, they, they just don't need it. Maybe that's it. <laughs> like... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, right, let's go back to saturated fat <laughs> so we can close this loop before. <laughs> yeah. So when you talk... So, I mean... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to ask, um, when you were talking about saturated fat and the, the potential negatives, I actually wrote this down as a note to bring up, was um, in the book, you seem to not like saturated fat very much. So I was just wondering. Oh, did I? <laughs> I can't remember quite what I wrote now. So I just um, wanted to I, get your opinion in overall, I mean, how it interplays with immune health, but also overall health. It just seems to be more pro-inflammatory. So it um, not only has this effect on the gut, which can raise inflammation, but we know it has an effect on this thing called the inflammasome, which I think is a really cool word, but it's something it is, that yeah. um, is involved in um, triggering that kind of acute phase response that leads to release of um, inflammatory cytokines. Uh, so this is something that we're understanding more and more about. Um, and it's also, I mean, people might uh, have different views on this, but it is highly linked to things like um, heart disease and atherosclerotic disease as well. But I think it's not like we need to avoid saturated fat because all foods contain a mixture of fats. So it's not just like 
foods will contain one type of fat unless you're just you know eating i don't know coconut oil is that not pretty high yeah, no, it's 100 <laughs> um, percent saturated i believe <laughs> but um generally things will have a mix of fats and you want to be maybe working to replace some of the foods higher in saturated fats with the unsaturated fats um but also ensuring that you're bringing in lots of fiber into your diet which is going to have this effect of, of, sort of sealing up the gut barrier um and countering that effect a little bit okay so two questions relate to what you say said once is uh, one is with regards to saturated fat have you looked at stearic acid and that's into play with immunity because i know that has a relatively a low effect to no effect on cholesterol levels. And that is a saturated fat. And things like cocoa butter, and it's quite high in um, beef tallow. And yeah, I just and it, have this, I, I don't know. So that's why I asked you. I know, I think I probably wouldn't feel that I have a handle on the real nuance mm-hmm. enough to, yeah. to know. But I do know that it's different depending on what the source is yeah. and it's probably different depending on what the overall pattern of diet is for that person so i think um it, yeah it's probably a tricky one to answer yeah no it was a very nerdy question so my <laughs> my apologies my apologies with <laughs> that one and to be honest i completely forgot what the what the follow up question was um it was something to do with saturated fat beef tallow different components I really like how you you broke it down there in terms of foods which are higher in saturated fat and higher in different and other fats as well because we never look at foods just with one component. You know, we never yeah. look at um, nutrients in isolation normally within a diet. They're always with something else. So if we're looking at saturated fat, there is some saturated fat in olive oil. And yet olive oil mm. was shown to be healthy in basically every study that has ever been performed yeah. on olive oil, especially with the hydroxytyrosol, et cetera, which has some numerous benefits as well, which maybe we will get the chance to dive into. Um, yeah. But something that you mentioned was autoimmune diseases. And that is something I would like to pick up with you as well, because it seems to be that autoimmune diseases get um, have a higher prevalence with age, but also women have a hard time with autoimmune dis- diseases yeah, as well. No. So, so I'd love to dive into what the reasons are behind that and why men seem to escape relatively unscathed. <laughs> yeah, well, if you kind of plot it up on a, a chart, women uh, suffer more autoimmune diseases, but men suffer more uh, cancers and um, uh-huh. uh, infectious diseases and cancers related to infectious diseases as well. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of, it, there's a distinction in the men and women in terms of um, their immune systems. And there's lots of um, immunity genes that are on um, the X chromosome that this seems to be part of the reason. Uh, we, we know that uh, the hormones play a huge role. So estrogen and progesterone and testosterone, they have receptors for them on our immune cells. So our immune cells can respond to these hormonal shifts. And obviously women experience differing hormonal changes to men. So from the um, puberty to just having a monthly menstrual cycle to menopause. And these are all kind of shifts that don't occur in men so this is all kind of feeding into how well um your immune system functions overall we know that estrogen tends to um make your immune system very good at uh fighting infection but it can also make it like tip over a little bit into uh, autoimmune disease and we know that the sort of balance of all the hormones is important because when menopause occurs um women quickly become on the same trajectory as men for sort of risks for things. Mm. But uh, it's, it's really kind of, it, it's a complicated area. We've seen it with COVID as well. So um, men are more susceptible to severe disease and then women sort of catch up once they hit menopause, unless they're taking HRT. Okay, that's really interesting. So I suppose in general, before menopause, women have a more robust immune system in terms of fighting infection than men. Yeah. Does this, because exactly. um, I've not seen any data on this, Does it, can you see this, like, for example, how many colds men get per year compared to women? 
Yeah, and how long it takes them to fight it off and this kind of thing. And, and I think when it comes to autoimmune diseases, there's a sort of psychosocial component as well. So the prevalence of autoimmunity has been increasing and we know about 80% of autoimmune diseases are in women, but it's since about the 1950s, we've seen this kind of rise happen really rapidly. Mm -hmm. So it's not just down to genes. It's not just down to gender. It's also contributed in part to the changes that have happened in women in the sort of social arena in that time. And what I mean by that is that, before that time most women would have stayed at home and then over the the decades women went out to work more and more now most um couples that have children will be dual working families so both mum and dad working full time um and the women and i'm generalizing here but there is some data to show that women tend to pick up a lot more of the childcare duties and the um, household tasks and that kind of thing, despite perhaps working as many hours as men, because traditionally they, they didn't tend to go back to work after having children or so quickly after having children. So it's kind of, there's a shift in how, um, how we live our lives really, which causes an additional stress um, to women. Because as a working mum, I find it really stressful to juggle work and kids. Um, and everybody's relationship would be unique. My husband commutes, so I am the one doing the childcare and organising that and doing most of the cooking and cleaning because he's not here to do that. But I also work the same number of hours as him. So it's it's stressful. And I think the stress is feeding into the effect on our immune system and the reason that we have this tidal wave of autoimmune diseases in women. Hmm. Okay, that's absolutely fascinating. And w with regards to stress, that obviously affects the immune system significantly. Do you think that there is a rise not only in autoimmune diseases, but chronic diseases um, across, yeah, I, I guess across everything? Because stress and cortisol interplay with not only uh, in cretins and you know ghrelin mm -hmm. etc but also like how you yes, um, yeah. yeah and how you partition nutrients yeah definitely i mean anybody who's ever been really stressed will know that it affects their appetite um an acute stress like you're running for your life you probably lose your appetite but then over time with this cortisol response you there there's studies showing that you you crave more kind of high energy quick energy foods and cortisol is making um glucose pour into your bloodstream because it's it's supposed to motivate you to safety you know like the stress response is actually protective to get you out of danger it's just when it goes on and on and on it becomes problematic so it's putting glucose from your liver from your muscles into your bloodstream to allow you to, to get to safety but then at the same time that's problematic when it's not just happening over a couple of hours. Um, and then you're going to have these blood sugar roller coasters. It's going to affect what you want and I, what you want to eat. And I also think of like the trickle down effect of stress. You know, when we're stressed, we don't sleep so well. That affects, mm. you know, what we want to eat the next day. Mm -hmm. It affects our mood. Um, it affects what healthful behaviors we engage in. So it's kind of all this cascade of things that happen. Uh, and I think for men and women, you know, the stress levels have, have skyrocketed in recent times. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, for me, if I'm stressed, I'm probably looking for something salty and savory. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> it is those hyperpalatable foods. It seems oh, yeah. to be a cycle yeah. of like having those foods and then those, mm -hmm. you overeat as a result of that. Because I, I know if I, if I sleep less, if I'm sleep deprived, I will crave food. I will probably yes, have to snack when yeah, um, quite often I'm not like that. I eat probably two to three times a day, um, but mm -hmm. I probably will definitely snack if I have slept less than, I mean, I'm, I'm probably quite luxurious with how much sleep I try and get, <laughs> but I normally try and stay in bed for eight hours. My aura yeah. ring always says I never sleep for that long, but that's what I try and do. Uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Do you wear an aura ring? No, but I would like to try. Um, I have an Apple Watch, but I actually 
charge it overnight because um, it's I use it in the day and it always needs the battery charging. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the next step would be an aura ring, which I've been uh, curious about for quite some time. Yeah, I mean, I really enjoy it, and if which I think you will, you, that you'll be you'll be able to use that data. I have a lot of friends mm-hmm. who ask me about it. Um, mainly because it's, it's quite prominent and I'm not wearing it right now. It's actually charging whilst we're yeah. speaking, um, but mm-hmm. it's quite chunky. So people ask me about it, but I find it really, really useful in terms of measuring HRV and also mm-hmm. how well you sleep. I try not to look at it every morning because I don't want it, want it necessarily to dictate how I feel. Yeah. Right? Because a lot of people look at it, oh, I slept badly, I'm going to have a bad day. I don't want that to be yeah. the case. But I definitely notice that my resilience to stress is less. And therefore, mm. my resilience to kind of, um, or how resistant I am to avoid hyperpalatable foods is also less. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's an interesting paradigm. <laughs> Something else that I wanted to speak to you about. Now, we've spoken about food. Dive into a little bit of phytochemicals because this is a really interesting yeah. component. Because I guess for me, I always think vitamins and minerals should be Mm -hmm. the foundation of anyone's diet right you want to look at nutrient density first but then phytochemicals are this other element which you can look at which seem to be hugely beneficial however i mean actually let's let's leave the however for now but it seemed to be hugely beneficial for different reasons what do you think are the most beneficial polyphenols there are and why that's a good question i think all fruits and vegetables uh, you and can't all their say colors all. <laughs> <laughs> now bear with me okay. you know they all their colors that are all these plant compounds these phytochemicals phytonutrients um are important but some are more important than others when it comes to the immune system but the reason i think i would find it hard to pick individual ones is because of the the additive and the synergistic effects that they play so they're kind of like an orchestra and that like they they work together and they work with your microbes in your gut to produce their effects Mm -hmm. um i think carotenoids which are in our orange uh vegetables um and there's about 40 different types of these they're really important and the polyphenols are probably the most complicated category because I think there's about 10,000 different polyphenols that have been identified. Um, If it came down to what you're putting on your plate, I think herbs and spices pack a good punch of phytochemicals that we often underestimate. Um, I think chocolate actually is ranked uh, as one of the foods highest in some of these antioxidants um, that come from the the polyphenol content. So cacao, I guess, Um, as well as herbal teas and coffees. Um, But then, you know, I think it's the harmonious interaction of them all. I think um, you want to look at the deep purple berries and the leafy greens that most of us are not eating enough leafy greens and i'm quite a fan of um the uh the citrus fruits because the they have these bioflavonoids in the in the sort of pithy stuff that helps vitamin c work even better so they spare it in and yeah exactly and I, I i really like the the sulfur the organosulfur compounds in the cruciferous vegetables and the um the alliums like garlic and uh that kind of thing garlic and onions and the alliums and then the cruciferous so the broccoli and and um, those type of vegetables because i think these are quite an interesting group of um um these glucose glu- I can't pronounce the name like the glucosinolates <laughs> um, in these uh, and they've got these sort of sulfur rich compounds which um, do loads of uh, interesting things I, I kind of think of them as longevity compounds so we don't have a recommended daily allowance per se so you might see a, you know your, your recommended uh, intake of the vitamins and minerals but there's no standard for these uh, longevity nutrients i kind of think it's more more is probably better and getting them from um food seems to be better than getting them from supplements because they're 
there's even studies showing that some supplements can be toxic mm -hmm. when taken it's just kind of you you're getting out of step with the synergy uh, and often the activity is in the dose so not necessarily more is better in terms of the immune system there's loads of in vitro studies so in in test tube studies looking at polyphenol extracts and we have curcumin which obviously comes from turmeric which is very popular and well researched and quercetin which is another one that's found in like onions apples so furafine which is part of these um, sulfur compounds and then egcg from green tea i'm not going to try and pronounce the, the gallocatechin 3 gallate well done <laughs> I never say these words out loud, so <laughs> it feels like a mouthful. Um, these are the ones that have been really well researched, but as I said, there's thousands of them and they're sort of working synergistically. And the test tube studies are great, but we don't have the long-term studies um, in humans really to, to know, can we bring together like a mix of the top five phytonutrients that would hit the immune system in the right way in this particular condition like an autoimmune mm. disease well so i just think well, sorry go ahead sorry i was just gonna say well professor robert thomas did uh, the pommy t trial yes yeah. yeah well that's all uh coming out right now and it's terribly exciting isn't it because oh. I was I was thinking in related to prostate cancer, but yes, oh, of there's course. also yes. there's yeah, also the one related doing... to COVID. Because when you were talking about different conditions, there are small studies which are looking at yeah. the syn synergy. But um, absolutely right, the few and far between. But the COVID one's going to be fascinating. I know. Yes, I'm really I'm curious to see what comes out. And I, I just think if people want to embrace the benefits of these, then it is about the diversity all those different plant compounds are doing many different things you know they're regulating gene expression they've got antioxidant properties they're improving your own internal antioxidants that some of them are antimicrobial it's it's you know i don't know trying not to be too reductive about it mm -hmm. and and bringing them in that's why i think you know things like herbs and spices and herbal teas they're a good way to just add on top of the the you know plants that are on your your plate at your meals as well yeah i do my best to so when i'm looking at my plate like how can i add more nutrients to this or more yeah. vegetables however purely just to be um i suppose like sometimes i'm on the run and i need to pick something up at a shop and i i, I yeah. tend to follow um, I know you don't like this, but a low carbohydrate paradigm, because <laughs> I know from your book, you said, <laughs> sorry, low carbers, your gut bugs just don't love you. Don't, <laughs> are just not that into just, you. I think I'm trying to find the page. <laughs> just not that. Yeah, it's like the film. Is it not a film? It's, he's just not that into you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to be fair, so like one of the, one of my meals is like, was a go-to for a, for a long time if I was just on the run so I try and do this irregularly or oh, not very often I should say um is just some form of protein whatever that is and then one large avocado but I get about 18 right. grams of fiber in that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah, I, that's, I mean that's something I would eat like I would go for like a bit of salmon and an avocado That'd yeah be yeah <laughs> yeah so that's like my go-to if I'm on the run or yeah. hiking or I, mean, I think you know, we can't limit our thinking to phytonutrients because there's also the myconutrients, so mushrooms and yeasts, oh, absolutely. Um, which have sort of really cool effects, particularly the beta-glucans in, in the fungi is like a plethora of studies looking at how they benefit the immune system. And then we have the zoo um, nutrients, would that be the correct term? Yeah, so yeah, things yeah. like astaxanthin, Carnosine, which gives salmon, taurine. Yeah, yeah, it's orange color. So, you know, these sort of bioactive compounds are also found in things other than vegetables. And we can just benefit from putting them on our plate and, and knowing that there's a synergy then that's happening. And uh, the magic is, is going on <laughs> with help from our gut microbes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What did you mention there that I want to talk about? Uh, the myco micronutrients you said so that from mm. mushrooms also aromatase inhibition 
which I find fascinating yeah, exactly. as well. Yeah. Um, especially because it affects men later on in life. So that is something which which people can include. And I'm like white bottom mushrooms are actually highly effective at blocking know, aromatase. Yeah. Um, you don't need to go and get all the fancy functional mushrooms if you either can't afford to or don't have access to or you know some of the mushroom powders are really expensive oh, they that really you can are. buy now so just a lot of people i think it's the taste and texture of mushrooms can put them off and you know chop them up really small add them to a dish that you already love like uh, chili or curries and then you don't even notice that they're there yeah that's that's a great idea i say the same thing if people want to consume all good meats it's yeah, like exactly. whack a little bit of liver into a bolognese and it'll just whack up the nutrient density. Yeah. If you're omnivorous, exactly. that is. Obviously, if you're a vegan, this is not available to you. <laughs> but <laughs> just yeah. to clarify. Um, what, one, of, one of the last things I wanted to cover uh, with you, Jenna, because um, I know we're short on time, is fasting. And also the mm. idea of the benefits that it has on senescent cells. Because senescent cells are a funny thing. I don't know why we get them. but um, And just yeah. to, get, to get your opinion on that and how we can reduce that as we age. Well, yeah, we, ha- we have kind of this... Um, it's not very often talked about, um, but I remember learning about it when I was studying uh, in my uh, early 20s. And it's this idea of the immunological space. There's only so much space in your body for immune cells. So you kind of have this fixed number of immune cells and that will be made up of new fresh immune cells and then sort of older cells. And it's kind of like anything that ages, it starts to go a little bit wrong with time. So we can get some of our older cells becoming what we call senescent. So they don't die, they just become kind of like zombies. And what they do is they spit out lots of pro-inflammatory cytokines and it's supposed to stop them uh, and have a kind of anti-cancer effect Mm -hmm. but at the same time it raises the slow level unwanted inflammation and when they spit out this inflammation they kind of pollute their own environment and make other cells senescent too so you kind of have to get rid of these senescent cells to allow space for these fresh new immune cells to be able to come out of your, your bone marrow. So it's, it's really not really well understood how your body keeps this homeostatic number of immune cells going, but basically you they're either being made new or they're being killed off. And the ones that are left are either healthy and functioning or becoming senescent. So we know that there's a few ways we can kind of get rid of the senescent cells. Um, and, and fasting is one uh, where it's been uh, is explored. I think it's something I don't really uh, talk about a lot because um, I'm always conscious that fasting might not be for everyone. And I don't yeah. really want people to May think that beneficial. they have to do it. I've spoken to people with with autoimmune conditions and one of the first things they asked me was should I do a fast you know and I'm like let's just look at everything else that's going on and where we mm. can make some improvements before we jump into something like that because you know there's a dark side to fasting that it might not be right for everyone also I think some people after fast they might overeat because they're very hungry and that can deteriorate your relationship with food but eating an extremely large meal can sort of exacerbate inflammation in the gut um, and that sort of thing and we don't actually have uh, a sort of protocol of the ideal amount of fasting I just do think from personal experience from the literature from talking to people that periods without eating are very important and one of the most significant changes in the way that we eat Um, over the last few decades that correlates with this rise in chronic diseases is that we actually spend longer in this postprandial or post-fed state, which we talked about earlier, is an inflammatory state. So I think there's um, work from Sachin Panda's lab where they used an app and they tracked um, how long people were in this sort of post-fed state, which is sort of the couple of hours after a meal. And it was, you know, almost 18 hours a day because people are just constantly eating across the the time that they are awake. Um, And the only time they're not eating is when they're sleeping. And a lot of people don't have the best sleep anymore. So that's also eroding your health. So it's kind of, um, I don't think we should be eating all the time. Um, And I do think that periods without food are important. And I think if people are curious, they should start just compressing their eating window and Mm. seeing how they feel. So 
think about when you have breakfast and when you normally have dinner and what's the time overnight that you're not eating? How long is that? Can you work towards it being 12 hours? Could you increase it? Could you consolidate your food into meals instead of having lots and lots of snacks across the day? So it's, it's tricky. I mean, I think I put in the book that I'm a bit of an anti-snacker. <laughs> Um, and I know that a few nutrition professionals have wanted to wrap my knuckles for that because, you know, there's lots of reasons why snacking can be useful, but I don't think we can deny the data that says that our snacking habits are part of the deterioration of our overall diet because the foods that we eat when we snack are not normally the incredibly healthy foods. They're normally the foods that we eat on the go that are hyper palatable, ultra processed foods. Um, and I know as a mother, when my kids snack, they don't have the same appetite for their meal. So they'll eat less of the meal. So um, I just find that, you know, it, it's it's about uh, finding what's right for you. But anyway, fasting, we do know, can sort of get rid of some of these senescent cells. It can get rid of um, autoimmune cells, damaged cells, and it can improve immune regulation so mm. the t regulatory cells that are keeping unwanted immune responses in check and i think this is going to be hugely fascinating area that's going to open up but there's also you know under eating calories um not having the same energy to perform tasks prolonged fasting you might not be able to to exercise or feel like exercising so you might have muscle wasting there's a lot of things that people have to there. consider yeah especially because if you think the the long-term outcome of a prolonged fast is is death so you've got to be incredibly careful with what you do and also like you made such a valuable point that you know if, you, if you're a bit and mineral depleted anyway or you, you don't have a healthy yeah. diet and you do a fast the outcomes are probably going to be less beneficial or like um, negative than they are beneficial um, and also refeeding syndrome is a thing if you fast more than yeah. three or five days you know it's po really important to do it with some professional advice yeah, um, or under yeah. the guidance of a health professional and people with, you know, if you're taking medications as well, there's contraindications there. So by no means are we suggesting that people go and fast, but you know, there are definitely instances where it can be beneficial for some people. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you hit the nail on the head with like just time restricted be, uh, eating is yeah. key and something everyone can implement, even if it's just pushing breakfast a little bit further into the day yeah. can have a huge benefit. And I think people can work with their natural rhythms there. So I'm an extreme morning person. Like I want to eat breakfast, but my husband isn't. So he will never eat breakfast. Um, and he's more of a kind of night owl. So you can sort of use your, your non-eating window that in tune with your sort of lifestyle and your preferences, if that's possible or available to you. Fascinating. And also, does this... Um, fasting kind of interplay with immunity like do you see it being beneficial in terms of the immune system and resistance to infection yeah I mean the, after a certain period of time either fasting or being on a ketogenic diet and you get this sort of rise in ketones these these have shown to be quite um anti-inflammatory in terms of stopping your immune system sort of overshooting um which is why it's thought that when we get a fever we lose our appetite uh, as a way to kind of curb the immune system so this hasn't been sort of really well fleshed out yet but there does seem to be a lot of hints from animal studies that um that, that perhaps it's a, an internal mechanism to switch off appetite, to stop that cytokine storm going ahead. And, and um, I don't know, maybe it's something we'll see that we can sort of use in clinical practice in the future. Yeah, like t targeted for certain conditions for sure, if it's anti-inflammatory. Yeah. Okay, I've definitely used ketosis before, like great benefit. And I did it during my university degree um purely mm -hmm. because it, i found it gave me some degree of mental clarity and stable energy levels yeah um yeah. so i could work later into the night probably not the best reason why i was using <laughs> it um but, but it was true so there you go little anecdote yeah. <laughs> um I've, I've got 
we're coming up on time, but I've got three questions that I ask everyone that comes on the show, show Jenna. So I'll make them nice and quick for you because they've taken up a lot of your time already. <laughs> but I've very much enjoyed it. Uh, the first question being, what is the most impactful health change that you have made in your life and why? Um, that's a good question. I think, I mean, it, it was probably when I took a step back from generic advice so uh, when I was a uh, as an adult I was diagnosed with celiac disease and um, I was always a very energetic child but would have these long periods of just being fatigued and unwell right from being a small baby and so I um, obviously cutting out gluten was an impactful change <laughs> but figure, it, figure. It, you know <laughs> even if you have diagnosis like that and you cut out gluten you're not just miraculously back to full health because Absolutely. you might start to feel better but there's more there's so much damage that's been done that your body needs to recover and I think I ended up you know this was way before social media so I wasn't doing this um with an audience or using social media to inform decisions but I did you take leave of my sort of rational self and started doing all sorts of things in desperation to feel better you know and um I think the best thing was when I realized that I was making progress but it was really slow and it just didn't there was no quick fixes out there and anything that anyone that's selling you a quick fix is probably just trying to make some money mm -hmm. and so I think now when we live in this world of social media and I, I know how upsetting it can be for people when they're given a diagnosis like an autoimmune disease it might have taken five or more years for them to get to that point and then you get this diagnosis and it's kind of like well yeah but now what it doesn't change anything um you might have some strong medication to take but it doesn't give you an agency over your health and I think it's just the slow steps, not looking for the quick fix, I think has been a big lesson that I learned. Oh, that sounds hugely valuable. Thank you for that. Um, and another one is how can healthcare become more integrated with some of the modalities that we have spoken about to get today? I guess Ooh. as a... <laughs> Go on. That's a really tricky one. I wish I knew the answer. It's like the holy grail, isn't it? Um, <laughs> well, I guess it's your opinion. That's what yeah, I'm I by. just think we need to look at our food environment because people are tired and busy and stressed. And when the food environment is full of hyper palatable foods, it, it, you know, we don't have the reserves to say no all the time. It's cheap, it's available, it's quick. And, you know, the busyness of our lives isn't going to change overnight. Um, the stresses of modern life are not going to disappear. So we kind of need the food environment to change. And that's something that, you know, with legislation and whatever, it could change pretty quickly. I don't think that it will because it's going to be a battle with um, the food industry. Um, I think we also need to think about what's been lost. So um, basic cooking skills have been lost um and that with that comes you know a need for convenience foods because people don't have the confidence or the knowledge or the tools or skills to cook so i think it's also a hugely socioeconomic issue so we need to kind of look at you know disparities in um uh, socioeconomic status it's really complicated and it's it's kind of almost quite it feels quite sad when you think about it um because we do have some of the tools and we do know what what could help people but the people who need it most are the ones less likely to have access to that i think um you know just fresh produce and mm -hmm. being able to cook meals from scratch and uh those kind of things like it's okay for for me to put that on instagram but at the same time the people who really need help doing that are not the ones who are going to be able to access it so yeah it's something that we all need to sort of work towards and the healthcare system is a massive ship to, to change its direction as you know i don't know an overwhelming task yeah I couldn't agree more with you, and I thought that was a really uh, good way of putting it. That the NHS is a it's a massive ship in order to change its direction. I really like that. Um, and I've got one final question for you, but before I ask it, can you please tell the listeners where they can find you and what exciting projects that you have coming up? Oh, 
um, yes, so I'm mostly on Instagram as Dr. So Dr. underscore Jenna underscore Machoki, which is M A C C I O C H I. I also have a website, which is just um, Dr. Jenna Machoki.com. Um, I have a newsletter and I'm getting better at being consistent across those platforms. <laughs> I'm occasionally on Twitter, but I find it a little bit more of a toxic space. So, um, but yeah, Instagram is probably the best place to come over and find me and interact with me. Um, and yeah, sign up for my website. I do have some exciting things coming up soon, but too early to mention, but you can be the first to hear about those. Um, yeah, if you yeah join me on social media. By the way, for the listeners, I will link to everything that Jen has just said in the show notes so you can access them there. Um, final question, can you provide the listeners with your own personal three quick tips to improve their health and well-being from today? Yeah, well, this is actually quite an easy question. Contrary to what people think about your immune system and vitamin C or zinc, I just think consistency across all the foundational elements of your health is the best. So consistently and sustainably eating a good diet you know finding a sleeping pattern that uh, makes you feel well rested moving in a sustainable way for you uh and finding tools to to mitigate some of the stresses that will inevitably come up in life so it's not about dramatic changes but if you can do lots of small things consistently that gives you the most bang from from your buck and that i would say that personal experience as well like consistency matters so it's got to be sustainable i think the second thing is something that i learn is self-compassion so just being a bit kinder to yourself not beating yourself up when you fail and there's actually some awesome studies looking at inflammatory markers and changes in the immune system in people who've been taught um, self-compassion techniques so things around mindfulness and and these kind of things and self-kindness and that kind of stuff so i think that, that's something people are interested they should look up and sort of read more about it's good for your immune system just good for your mental health and i think the final thing is is, is boundaries and balance so um i learned the hard way <laughs> that we all need to have boundaries uh, and we all need a bit of balance don't underestimate the impact of your thoughts and your emotions on your immune system if you want to have a balanced diet and enjoy a bit of food that you love but it might not be the most healthful food then the endorphins uh, from and the neurochemicals that are produced from that enjoyment are just as important for your immune system as eating you know meals packed with nutrition um and i just think you know doing things that you enjoy and bring you joy in your your life that's also filtering down you know to how your immune system is is responding to the world that we live in jenna that was absolutely wonderful i just want to say a massive thank you for coming on the show and speaking to me today i've thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it and i do hope that we can do this again soon <laughs> thank you for listening to the functional health podcast you can find links to everything that we talked about today in the show notes if you have a second please consider leaving a five-star rating on itunes it really does make a huge difference and helps get this valuable information out and reach more people don't forget to subscribe so you can stay up to date and know whenever I release a new episode. You can connect with us on Instagram, Facebook or our website and all questions are welcome. As always, thanks to Joss Aurelia for all the editing and thank you all for your support.